Hey everyone, this is Moderate Rebels. I'm Ben Norton. My colleague Max Blumenthal and I did a live stream interview with Daniel Dumbrell. He's a Canadian YouTuber who has lived in China for over a decade, and we talked a lot about the Western propaganda myths targeting China and the new Cold War. This is part two of our discussion. We de debunk more of these new Cold War talking points, and we also address questions from our patrons over at patreon.com slash moderate rebels. Now, I, I do want to say, please excuse us. We had some internet issues, or I had internet issues in this live stream, but fortunately in this segment here, I have tried to edit out all of the technical errors we had. So without further ado, here's the second and final part of our discussion with Daniel Dumbrell. I'll never apologize for the United States of America. Ever. I don't care what the facts are. Why are we going to sit down and talk to these quote-unquote moderate rebels? Who are the truly moderate rebels? The search for the moderate rebel. Do these moderate rebels exist? Moderate rebels. It, it's just a clear difference, I think. Americans don't understand. They so want to accuse China of being an empire, but I think that colonial history, that history of being colonized instills, imbues Chinese politics and Chinese foreign policy with an anti-colonial perspective. Uh, and it also leads it to, I think we see all, and, and there is an opportunistic aspect to it when, when China, when China's in Africa or in Latin America, Absolutely. or when China is coming to, um, coming to the aid and support of countries like Venezuela at the UN Security Council, again, I think that history of being colonized informs and influences their actions there. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of, um, it's probably uh, surprising when people hear about the perspectives of, of China and how they operate. Everything that China does, um, I, I think the West is probably looking at it as you know, well, what, what, what would we be doing if we were in that same situation? So it's a lot of projection, whether it be genocide. It says, well, of course they're doing this because we do genocide and we've done genocide or sterilizations. Of course they must be doing that because we do sterilizations or whether it's going into Africa. It's like, well, they must want to colonize them and completely uh, destroy their country because that's what we do. <laughs> and it's like, no, you've got to completely change your frame of mind with how uh, China thinks. It's not it's not perfect, but it's it's nothing like what people are perceiving through uh, uh, a lot of it guided by their own experiences about what they do when they're a superpower, what they're supposed to do. I actually think I would I would offer a more severe perspective on that. Maybe it's because I'm here, which is that uh, there's an attempt to revive American exceptionalism as this country kind of crumbles from within and the American dream of being able to become part of the middle class becomes an illusion. Uh, and that means that if we can displace our problems and the scandalous history of extermination and mass incarceration onto another country, uh, then it will kind of weaken the internal critique of the U.S. that's coming from its oppressed populations. And people will have to say, well, I'm glad I'm an American. I'm not in China. And I think a lot of it's just motivated by sheer racism, the belief that Chinese people are just like these blind ants following a dictator and that they are uncivilized and capable of carrying out Nazi level atrocities. I think that's essentially what it thrives off of. And that um, even falls on fertile soil within progressive circles. Yeah. And there's, I think there's enough of a lack of awareness uh, of what the U.S. really does around the world uh, for it to be an easy sell, where right. Um, right. even if they do know that the U.S. does some bad things, they don't know the extent of it. Um, I think there's some comfort they can take in knowing that, oh, well, there's this country over here that's way worse than us. And well, actually, no, it's not. And yeah. every little thing that China does, I mean, even from poverty alleviation, you know, raising hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, what does the West focus on when they do those stories? They say, oh, my God, there was a picture of Xi Jinping in one of these guys' houses. They were given a free house, but at what cost, you know? Um, or when uh, she came out recently and said the, 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 a very accurate statement, the biggest threat to uh, China's stability, growth and stability is the U.S. Um, and it's just a very factual statement. But you saw people retweeting that saying, oh, oh, my God, you know, if you weren't scared before, you should be scared now. 
because they have very, <laughs> you know, they have a lack of awareness that, well, that is a very accurate statement, not only for China, but for almost every country in the global south, including Latin America, the biggest threat to their stability and growth is America. I mean, it's just a factual statement. But yeah. again, because of the lack of awareness, they see that, oh, that is a, that is the words of an aggressor. It's like, well, no, yeah. Well, and, yeah. If, and if you look at international polling, I mean, the the Pew Glo Global Polling Agency has published polls showing that people around the world recognize the United States as the largest threat. And that's, yeah. that's a statement of fact. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So again, I mean, la lack of awareness. Um, uh, but but yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, the, right now in the U.S., there's this retrospective on the Syrian conflict. It's the tenth anniversary. It's it's not actually the tenth anniversary. It, it, it's that that's the, you know it's the tenth anniversary in the way that the Syrian opposition has constructed the narrative of an uprising to supposedly oust the Assad regime. Although many of the protests were simply reformist in nature, but just by marking this as the tenth anniversary, it ignores the whole U.S. role in the destabilization of Syria. It's just erased. From the entire narrative, if we were to really start to understand the Syrian conflict, we would see it as a war on Syria. And I couldn't even point to a point to a to a date where it actually began. I mean, did it begin with the '67 war? Uh, where I mean, did it? When, when, when did it? When, when a U.S. proxy was essentially attacking it and occupied the Syrian Golan Heights? I mean, did it begin in the '70s when? Hafez al-Assad directly accused the U.S. of weaponizing the Muslim Brotherhood to internally destabilize the country. Uh, did it begin in 2000, what was it, 2004 with the Syrian Accountability Act when neocons in Congress passed a bill to sanction Syria, put the, you know, imposed the first serious sanction, serious sanctions on Syria? Uh, did it begin in uh, 2005, 2006 when the U.S., embassy in Syria started actually working with members of the Syrian opposition to begin uh, starting getting the gears going, getting the wheels rolling for a real regime change operation, actually, you know, paying and recruiting them. When did it actually begin? Doesn't, none of, none of this is included. You will not hear anything about the U.S. program, uh, Operation Timber Sycamore, to literally contribute billions of dollars to the birth, growth, training, and uh, escalation of Wahhabi Contras, essentially mil militia groups very much like the uh, ETIM or um, TIP, which was, became part of their constellation in Syria, to destabilize Syria, cause massive amounts of death, attack Alawite villages, uh, attack the Syrian army, take large portions of Syrian territory, put them under the control of extreme religious law. I mean, this is all completely airbrushed. And so, I, I mean, you can look at it as a microcosm of the way the U.S. campaign against China is being covered inside the U.S., where we're, we're just innocent victims here. We're just like a rabbit in the woods, and there's this ferocious China, which just for some reason spends like what, one twentieth of what the U.S. spends on its military attacking us and threatening us. We have to counter them. What's China doing in the South China Sea? That's our sea. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, no, it's remarkable. I mean, I don't know enough about this serious situation, but I've been starting to follow it a lot more. And it really is remarkable where how tone deaf the public is, where even I retweeted an LA Times reporter um, is there in Syria on the oil field saying they're there with the U.S. Department of Defense protecting the oil fields. Protecting it's, the oil fields. It's like, how, are these people hearing themselves? And and then there's a video by a, a, an outlet called AJ Plus. They show outside of the oil fields where Syrians are literally digging through the garbage freshly as it's being dumped from the garbage trucks to see if there's anything they can salvage or if there's any food or something like that. I mean, th this is... Uh, you know, obviously, the 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 I, I said before when when Trump was continually saying, um, you know, we're going, we're gonna, we're protecting the oil, we're keeping the oil, we like oil, and it's like he's just saying it outright, and people were outraged. And I remember retweeting that and saying, well, th this actually isn't a Trump thing; this is an America thing. Um, and now this LA Times reporter is there under, you know, while the Biden administration is in place and pretty much, you know, doing the same thing, but without saying the loud bits, the quiet bits out loud 
uh, too much. Um, but yeah, no, it's, and then, and then, you know, getting back to the Xinjiang topic too, though, you, you know, the other thing that they're doing is, um, other than promoting these organizations who, if they really did take control of Xinjiang, would uh, oppress the people um, in, in, in such an extreme way, they're also sanctioning a lot of companies that are producing products in uh, Xinjiang, which are, uh, they say, are made with a, a slave labor without any real evidence of it. And so uh, what's been interesting is, so what, it, what that does, though, is it, it, uh, uh, it it uh, makes companies, international companies, wary about setting up uh, factories in special economic zones in Xinjiang. It makes pre-existing companies like Volkswagen or anything else uh, wary of hiring Uyghur people uh, based on the potential of being accused of having a slave laborer in their company. And it's basically taking the livelihoods away from Uyghurs, which is exactly what really sanctions are designed to do um, to kind of make a people suffer so that they are discontent and rise up against their government. And then what's interesting is then Uyghurs are traveling outside of province now to find jobs. And then other people are pointing out, well, this is the form of cultural genocide. Now they yeah. have to travel so far away from home to find a job. It's like, you're, this is what, this is what you're doing. Um, uh, but but uh, yeah, the, the situation is the 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 intervention. What they're doing um, is not is not designed to help uh, is not designed to help Uyghur people, and on the contrary, it's counterproductive uh, to the region. And meanwhile, you know, so they're they're sanctioning companies um, for uh, operating in Xinjiang, and meanwhile, the exact same uh, military contractors who were involved in Abu Ghraib are not only not sanctioned, but receiving multi-million dollar contracts. As you remember a few months ago, I sent you, Max, uh, one of those articles that they just won, uh, I can't remember how many hundred million you know, uh, dollar contract. And these are companies that are involved with indisputable torture of Muslims overseas. Um, it's just, uh, it's a remarkable thing to, uh, to, see, to, yeah. see, to see unfold. Yeah, uh, when I get a chance, um, I mean, there's, a, there's a, a story about this that, it's truly shocking. And I, you know, again, I don't want to reveal the details of the story now, but what I would say is that the NGOs who are pushing this campaign about, you know, forced labor in Xinjiang and pushing companies to leave, they actually know, they are acutely aware that they are denying uh, Uyghur citizens in the autonomous region of Xinjiang of their jobs. And they know that they're depriving them of livelihoods and they have absolutely no interest in providing them with any relief once they force these companies out. And I'll demonstrate that in this. Yeah, this absolutely. I think, yeah. I think, I think to make matters even more ironic is one of the uh, think tanks that are re that's really pushing the China threat story, as you probably know, is uh, ASPI, the Australia yeah. Strategic uh, Policy Institute. Um, and they are very, very active with pushing the China threat story. Um, and they're funded by uh, the military industrial complex, you know, Lockheed yep. Martin, Boeing, Raytheon, all these companies. And so then they end up selling weapons uh, to then counter that China threat story that they just finished manufacturing, um, which is a, a conflict of, the in, uh, of interest, to say the least. But what's even more ironic is that these companies... You know, they are engaged in prison labor in the U.S. to make their parts, it, highly exploitative prison labor. So here you have a, a think tank funded by the military industrial complex, which is run by prison labor, pushing these China threat stories and, and, and uh, China prison labor stories, um, and then profiting on the back end. Because I don't know if you saw, there's now a $57 billion proposal to basically line the, the nine dash line outside of the, the China's nine dash line uh, with uh, missiles. You know, the nine dash uh, it, line is the line where the U.S. says China is not allowed to cross in the South China Sea, essentially. Well, yeah, or or, or China's uh, China's uh, claim. China's also kind to, of set to, its red line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so they um, they basically put their they they I don't I don't think it will actually go through. But even to suggest that to put that through in the government as a suggestion to line the coast of China with missiles. I mean, you you have to ask yourself what would happen if a if an aggressive uh, a foreign power. Uh, tried to put missiles in Cuba. I mean, we don't, we don't have to imagine too hard about that. So now here I am going to be in, in Shenzhen with my family surrounded by American uh, weapons of mass destruction that these companies uh, have uh, it, uh, managed to push through the idea is a, is, a, is a reasonable idea because of their work in, uh, through their think tanks of pushing the China threat story. It's just this circular thing that's going on that's absolutely ridiculous. 
Uh, but as you said, you know, the average right. person who's just consuming regular news, they don't they don't get all of this uh, information underneath. No, they don't. And and it's also why CGTN had to be momentarily removed by Ofcom in the UK, why RT had to be labeled a foreign agent and why we're all under attack is that diversity of media is something that we can't have. We can't have this kind of context. And, you know, fun fact, the furniture that was destroyed on January 6th by pro-Trump rioters will be replaced with furniture made by prison labor. That's just a fact. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why yeah, that's no. not a front page story like, you know, Adrian Zentz's reports on prison labor. It seems to pertain to us. Everyone's talking about the insurrection. Why can't we hear more about that? It's But it's a fact. Um, right. The Congress is required to source its uh, labor to prison labor by the U.S. government. It's just a fact. Uh, ben, yeah. I don't know if there are any more questions or you want to jump in. Yeah, well, I'll, I was, there's one comment I was going to add, and then we'll go back to some Patreon questions. But you mentioned about how the U.S. and, and other countries' sanctions on China vis-a-vis -vis Xinjiang will ironically end up hurting Uyghurs by by ending their possibility for employment in particular industries. And, and, I, and I would add that that also might be part of the intentional strategy. I mean, we were talking about how the U.S. is clearly trying to encourage a new insurgency in Xinjiang, a separatist movement, just as we know that the CIA sponsored a Tibetan insurgency for many decades. The Dalai Lama is a longtime CIA asset. This was reported by the Associated Press and the New York Times. So it, it seems quite clear that the U.S. is trying to encourage more of that sentiment against the Chinese government, not only through the propaganda, but by through depriving Uyghurs of their livelihoods, of jobs, which will make them more desperate and will encourage at least some people to move into extremist movements and insurgencies. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I definitely think it is. I definitely think it is the intention. I mean, you can look at any other example. Uh, now that they've accomplished their goals in Libya and they're literally they're trading slaves in open markets now, it's not really a concern anymore. It doesn't matter what's going on with the people uh, on the ground anymore. Uh, I mean, the goal has never been liberation. The goal has never been human rights for people. And I think that should be abundantly clear to everybody by now. Um, and that's most certainly not the case for their intentions in um, in Xinjiang. Yeah, well, a lot of people are commenting about how I've been frozen the whole time, but I have been enjoying <laughs> I have been enjoying the conversation and learning a lot. But Ben's as not for, really frozen. He's there. It's just you can't. See I'm just him practicing. Move. I'm practicing my ventriloquism. I'm getting really <laughs> good at. I just like freezing my face. Like yeah, honestly, and, who ca who cares? Like it's not like I'm doing anything interesting. Like. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, yeah, we just do the video part because we are already doing a podcast and we're like, hell, might as well just do the video as well. But, you know, a lot of people end up just listening anyway. And and for people interested, yes, this will be, I will edit out any potential errors or anything. And this will be a podcast version as well that can be downloaded after the fact. Yeah. But and Daniel, a few more questions on our Patreon here. One is from... Mike R., I mentioned earlier, this is about how the economy works in China. He said that Chinese leaders famously described the country's development model as socialism with Chinese characteristics. What defines this model and practice? And how does the state balance the socialism components with the privatization aspects that currently exist in the Chinese economy? I think uh, now, so I'm not really uh, an economist, so this this question maybe is a little bit out of my uh, my league here. But uh, I, I could just you know just from observations on the ground, um, what I can see is going on is there's a continual um, effort to create um, uh, more and more access to healthcare, either free healthcare or highly subsidized healthcare. And I think there's certain industries that you will never ever see privatized. Um, I think that's probably going to be one of the most important things. Like if you look back when um, you know the U.S. had a highly sophisticated uh, a rail system, one of the best rail systems in the world, um, and then you had the car companies kind of coming in and buying up uh, streetcar companies and paving over them to make roads for cars. I think there's uh, mechanisms in control uh, in place here where you would never see anything like that happen. Um, so I think. Uh, that's probably the best I can do with that answer is just that there are 
controls in place to make sure that capitalism doesn't get too far out of control. Um, you know, uh, making sure uh, price fixing doesn't happen. Here in Shenzhen, there was a uh, there was a scandal where there was a, a, a gar a, a, an area here where all of the owners of those apartments kind of got together and they were fixing the prices to make sure the prices were going up at a certain rate. And the government came in and, and I don't know if there were any punishments for that, but they basically broke that up. So they're constantly getting involved to try to make sure that the market doesn't get too far um, out of control. I think um, the Chinese government's uh, venture into the digital RMB also um, is potentially also an attempt to, uh, to make sure that the government doesn't get uh, left out on the uh, kind of um, global online payments market, which is going to be a, become a very important uh, and integral part of obviously the Chinese economy here. It already is. Um, so you see, um, uh, you see some initiatives to make sure that the most important sectors have some sort of a, um, a national element to it. Uh, but again, I, I, that's probably as deep as I can go. Uh, somebody who's an economist would probably be able to give a better answer than me on that though. I think, uh, that, that was, a, that, I think that was a great answer. And I think, you know, it also goes back to the history of colonization in China and the. A uh, whole fight for independence and sovereignty and self determination that the Communist Party of China has waged. Mao Mao Zedong uh, referred in the 1930s to a national bourgeoisie or a patriotic bourgeoisie that the Communist Party would have to work with to found an independent and sovereign nation. He wasn't talking about. Uh, nationalizing everything and completely liquidating the bourgeoisie. He was actually talking about right. a dialectic that many countries in the global South that seek socialism have to engage with because of the reality of imperialism, because of the reality of being surrounded and encircled by capitalism and having capitalism within, that it's just simply practically impossible to, to wipe it out, liquidate it, nationalize everything. And so China went through a long-term process of um, socialism with Chinese characteristics that's still ongoing and has seen uh, a market flourish at the same time as the eradication of extreme poverty, which was yeah. celebrated two weeks ago. I think it's one of the most inspiring accomplishments of the 21st century. And there was a great documentary that began airing on PBS affiliate. It's about it in S I uh, tweeted about it. I tweeted a link to it. I, and I, I, I wasn't prepared now, but I mean, I wish we could like introduce it here, but um, this was a, a film by a China expert who was an economist who knew China and he went out with communist party cadres into the countryside, into areas that were completely neglected and showed how they integrated themselves into the community, won the trust and respect of locals and helped them, basically counseling them into new lives, giving them, giving them free housing, uh, providing education for their children. And it also changed the lives of the cadres to get out in the countryside and meet these people and become almost like a part of their family. And I've yearned for a, a, a program like that in the United States. I wish someone would summon me to say, we're going to go out and build infrastructure and you're going to go out and you know change this country along with your neighbors of different classes. And you're going to work together to do something you know, and help educate people. But nothing like that happens here. It happened, it's happening in China. And this documentary was effectively censored. It came under attack by the right. Free Beacon, a neoconservative publication. PBS started getting angry letters from right wingers, more bad press, and it was taken off the air. And it only aired on like two or three, you know, Fort Dallas, Fort Worth, and Sacramento. And the entire country should be seeing this. They should be seeing what's oh, happening. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's such a threat to see any good news out of China. So oh, the, yeah. the US hasn't heard anything about what just happened. Yeah, the biggest I think the biggest thing um, is that, that something like that would would cause uh, people to think inward a little bit more and think about actually accomplishing something at home. Um, but as um, Adam Curtis, I think, in one of his documentaries said was that, you know, the, the, the politicians in the West, they've become people who uh, no longer deliver dreams, but protect you from nightmares. 
Um, and if you if you saw that there was a dream coming true in China, that's that's a threat to that whole kind of a makeup of how you do things. And the poverty alleviation was amazing. It wasn't it wasn't a matter of just giving people handouts. It was about teaching them how to fix their house if something goes wrong, um, if their livestock gets you know sick or what to do. You know different things about uh, a social work element also, if they weren't raising their kids well or you know, humiliating them by yelling at them in front of you know groups of people, there's a social work aspect also. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was really amazing. To tie it back into the other question too, in terms of making sure that kind of uh, 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 this socialism uh, kind of survives, I think one really important uh, aspect of that also was the massive crackdown on corruption. Um, you know, that's, you know, lobbying itself, is illegal in um, in um, in China, and, and that made for some interesting articles also. Because when 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 uh, officials here were arrested for corruption, um, a lot of people were using that data overseas to say, "Wow, well, you see how much corruption China has." Well, well the thing is, is th that's not even illegal in your country. So that's an important piece of context: is you're allowed to have this kind of lobbying um, uh, system in your country. Uh, but from a, a personal perspective on the ground, I've seen it happen also from, you know, 2008, 2009, you know, the big thing here was, you know, you had to give government officials, you know, red envelopes and stuff like that to get anything important done. And uh, while I don't think that's completely been eliminated, it's almost been eliminated where you just don't get the same kind of thing. People are worried about it because they know corruption um, is a uh, really, really uh, serious crime here. Um, and that helps to make sure that the kind of the, the capitalism that goes on in China doesn't get out of control where they, uh, you know, money is used to push through uh, projects or, um, you know, uh, give advantage to people who have their way to, to, to have the means to pay to play. Yeah. And I, I kind of I want to bring Ben in here because, you know, this question really relates to a critique that we hear so much about China being state capitalism. Uh, the same critique can, is often applied to Venezuela, and it was a Schachtmanite Trotskyist critique that originated with his attack on the Soviet Union or his criticism of the Soviet Union, that it was not actually a socialist country. It was just state capitalism. Um, it's, an, it's what we would call kind of ultra-leftism, but I mean, how, how do you respond to it? I mean, my response is it just doesn't acknowledge the existence of imperialism. Yeah, and it doesn't respond to the particular material conditions on the ground. I mean, I think that we could talk about this for an entire episode and it would be interesting. Yeah. I mean, especially, you know, a lot of people in the comments are talking about Michael Hudson, who is a brilliant economist. We've had him on. In fact, I want to bring him back sometime because he, you know, he's a, a Marxist economist who's also kind of heterodox economist in other ways. He's got a variety of influences and he, he has taught in China. He's a very interesting guy. And we talked, we did an episode with him and he talked about the situation of economic decoupling that we're, we're seeing right now because was, there was a process over decades since the 1972 historic Nixon visit to China in which China and the U.S., it's true. It, it's true at the end of the first Cold War, China and the U.S. allied against the Soviet Union. China took this kind of ultra left extreme position that so Soviet so-called social imperialism was a bigger threat than U.S. led capitalist imperialism. So they, they unified together against the Soviet Union. That was one of the main reasons for the counter revolution in the Eastern Bloc. And, you know, that that's a long, complex history. It's not to say that the Soviet Union was on the perfect side either. There's critiques of both sides. But what, what's interesting about that history is now that the U.S. succeeded in helping to overthrow the Eastern Bloc. It eventually was inevitable that it would turn back against China, especially because China refused to subordinate its economy to Western capital. So I think when it comes back to this question of whether or not China is socialist, for me, it's such an academic question. And it's always these people, you know, these people in the U.S. and Canada and Western Europe this is a very academic discussion that I think is often not really related to what working class people on the ground have been experiencing. And the reality is that the material conditions of people in China have significantly improved. I mean, they've ended extreme poverty and that's that's an important gain. And I think what it comes down to is that it's it's an understanding of socialism that is not a useful definition. And it's frequently socialism is taken to mean state control of the economy but not looking at what the state actually represents. So this is fascinating. I mean, we see people like, like in, in the case of Matt Brunig's argument, he says that, 
oh, well, Venezuela is nothing compared to Norway because Norway, in terms of just the sheer percentage, technically has more state control of the economy. But Norway is involved with NATO. It, it backed the NATO war that destroyed Libya, it, which was a country that had the highest standard of living in Africa that provided health care and education for people and housing for people. So if, if your only metric is just state control of the economy, Saudi Arabia is the most socialist country in the world, according to that metric. Saudi Arabia, which is basically a feudal country, but it has state control over huge aspects of the economy. It's not a useful metric. What, what's a more important metric is wh who, what class is in control of society? Because this comes back to this issue of Venezuela. It is true that in Venezuela, more than 90% of the economy in terms of GDP comes from privately owned businesses. That's true. And the Chavista process has been a very contradictory process. There's a lot of internal contradictions. But the reality is that the state in Venezuela is not controlled by the oligarchy at all. The oligarchy has been at war with the state since Hugo Chavez came into power consistently. I mean, for 20 years now. And similarly in China, the state is under the control of the Communist Party of China. Now, there's a lot of contradictions in that party. There's been a lot of ideological fighting in that party. And you can say what's interesting is that that Xi Jinping represents a turn back toward the left, whereas you could say that that Chiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, to, to, you know, the, the, these are complex historical discussions, and I'm certainly not an expert. I would never claim to be an expert. But you could say that, well, they represented a kind of certain other wing of the party. Xi Jinping is, is, represents a more left-leaning nationalist wing that is trying to reassert the the Marxist elements of the Communist Party of China, whereas previously in, in, in the post dung era, there was a move toward, you know, market socialism. But the reality is that in China, the Communist Party of China controls the state. The, the oligarch, you know, the elements of this kind of billionaire class that has emerged, they do not control the state. And in fact, they've been disciplined by the state. They've been disciplined by the party, which is something very different. In the United States and in Canada and Western Europe, these are states that are controlled by the oligarchy, by the capitalist class. They act on behalf of their interests. And if you look at China, the commanding heights of the economy, which is something that if you go back and read Vladimir Lenin, he's talking about the, the importance of the control of the commanding heights. And, you know, th this, this has been used by opportunists throughout history, but Le Lenin talks about the importance of war communism. When the Soviet Union, after the revolution, was invaded by 22 imperialist countries, including the United States and other countries, that were supporting the whites, that were trying to overthrow the Bolsheviks. And then, by the way, they also would have had a mass ethnic cleansing. They would have carried out a genocide against Jews because they were also very anti-Semitic. But anyway, the point is that there was this, this moment of war communism, as it was called. And the, the argument that Lenin and, and other elements of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union made was that as long as the commanding heights of the economy are controlled, the party is controlled, the, the capitalist class is held back, we still are moving on the road towards socialism. And if you look at China, the infrastructure is, is run by, it's built by state-owned companies. The telecommunications is still largely state-owned. The banking sector, the financial sector, which is the most important part, is state-owned. So I would say it's a contradictory process. And, you know, if you look at the, the late brilliant economist, political economist, Samir Amin. I mean, he certainly had a lot that he criticized about China and he said that it's a very contradictory process. But the reality is that, you know, what's so funny is that in, in the US and in North America and Western Europe, there's often this idea that there's socialism and there's neoliberalism and there's nothing else. And what socialism is, is like this vague concept that's like out in the void. and It's like some celestial platonic abstract. But the reality is that, that, neoliberalism is, is a particular phase of capitalism. And what we're seeing is that there's a certain kind of state-led development that is actually developing the country. And if we're supposed to believe that China is just totally neoliberal and is their economy is basically no different from these Western neoliberal countries, then why has it been able to develop at such a massive scale? Why has China been able to end extreme poverty, whereas India... In India actually was colonized by the British until a, a popular revolutionary movement that ended the British colonialism and independence came into 1947. So we see that independence came in India 
two years before it came in China with the victory of the communist revolution in 49. And we've seen that India has not at nearly the same level been able to fight poverty, not at nearly the same level been able to develop its country. So are we supposed to believe that these are cultural differences? That, that's not, a, that's not a, a materialist understanding of history. It's not cultural differences. There clearly have, has been a state-led development in China that has worked in a way, and it's been a complex contradictory process. And of course, no one seriously is saying that it's the same model as the Soviet Union or the Maoist era. I mean, there has been elements, and China has called it market socialism. But the reality is that the commanding heights of the economy are still controlled, just as in Venezuela, the commanding heights of the economy are still controlled. But the majority of the economy in Venezuela is still in private hands. I mean, it's a complex process, but the reality is that these are also poor countries that are going through processes of development. So you can't compare the process of development in a country like the United States or Western Europe that developed their countries based on slavery and colonialism. And those are totally different historical processes. So, okay, yeah, I mean, it is kind of goofy to pretend like China is still abiding by the Maoist model. It absolutely has not been. It's been a market socialist model, but that is fundamentally a distinct model from the model in the United States, which is a neoliberal model in which the billionaire oligarch class controls the economy. There is right. not, the, the, the state is not controlled by an institution that represents the actual working class of the country. It is totally controlled by the oligarchy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I mean, those, those things all make sense. I'm a little bit out of my element with the socialist discussion, but I can talk about anecdotal, anecdotal evidence that kind of points to the fact that this is yeah exactly what they're trying to do where they don't let kind of um you know capitalism run out of control there was one interesting story about so i mean obviously road infrastructure is an important part of uh, china and uh in the beginning to build highways and bridges they used to go to private capital to help them build it and um a, a part of the story i don't know if it's true or not but this is a story i've heard a few times so uh, Li Kai Shing is a pretty one of the richest guys in Hong Kong. If not, I think he is the richest guy in Hong Kong. He has a lot of investments in China, and uh, he owns the Yentian Port in uh, Shenzhen. And there's an important tunnel that goes to it um, that is ends up also being a key corridor to get up to the next city north, uh, Huizhou, without having to take a really long route. And he so he built that tunnel, um, and he was given the ability to collect um, uh, collect uh, a toll fee. And so after many, many years, he made his money back on the tunnel and quite a bit more. And uh, that was when China decided, OK, we want to start re uh, kind of nationalizing some of these important parts of our infrastructure. And so they went to Li Kaixing and said, OK, we, we want to buy this back from you because we want to make it free to the public. We want to make this a public, you know, public road. And he didn't agree. And they tried to negotiate, negotiate. No, it didn't didn't agree. So they said, OK, well, we, we've got money now. And so what they did, according to the story, is they built a tunnel right beside it and made it free. And nobody went through his uh, tunnel anymore. And so then he came back and said, "Okay, all right, all right, we're willing, we're willing, we're, I'm willing to sell it now." He said, "Okay, cool, yeah, but the price has gone down a bit, <laughs> you know." So how much of that story is true or not, I'm not sure. But they did turn that from a privately owned toll road into a free road now, and it almost, it almost makes me think. Listening to your story about how they're trying to undermine countries like Venezuela is, I think, maybe part of it is making sure that the country doesn't get to a point where they even have the ability to start renationalizing some of its important sectors, um, you know, bringing it back into the uh, public realm, um, which is uh, kind of, uh, they probably know that eventually they might be able to succeed just like China did in that regard, but they're not even allowing it to give, a, give, them, give them a chance, uh, deciding for them who their government should be relocating, uh, re, uh, 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 the, the U.S. dollars that are under control of one guy, moving it to another guy who the, the U.S. Pr uh, you know, uh, prefers. It's quite quite interesting to see it all unfold. And hearing you talk about this ties in a lot of the context that uh, helps people understand it a bit more. Yeah. In Venezuela, the U.S. has definitely failed in its ultimate goal, which is to restore control to the oligarchy that is traditionally controlled politics and society. But it's claiming some degree of credit for what it sees falsely as the government of Nicolas Maduro moving away from the Chavista model of mass nationalization. And that um, that's the maybe the, the, the closest it can come to claiming victory through sanctions, through starving the country of revenue. Venezuela has Venezuela's um, 
constituent assembly has had to pass an anti-blockade law, which allows uh, more parts of the economy to open up to private capital, but under the control of the government with the revenue used to fuel the social programs or keep the social programs that were established, like the, the CLAP food program, uh, the free housing program, Mission Vivienda, those programs alive and to keep this revolution alive. But under this kind of external and internal pressure, we saw for the first time in the Venezuelan legislative elections, the emergence of a kind of ultra-left politics that broke away from the traditional Chavista Pesuv party and ran under the banner of the Communist Party, won like a tiny percentage of votes, less than 2%. And they were kind of echoing in a weird way the U.S. narrative and taking to the New York Times to say our government's abandoned the Chavista Bolivarian, the real spirit of the Bolivarian revolution by enacting this anti-blockade law. And what they had to offer in as an alternative to the constituents that to the constituency that was built by the Pesuv party was non-existent. They didn't actually have an alternative. I kept looking for their program. They're like, we need to go back to Chavez's program here or there. That it just nothing was practical and there was nothing to offer. Meanwhile, when I put the critique to Delcy Rodriguez, the vice president, and basically the finance minister, or, or, or you know, really someone who's um, presiding over this, this program of fighting sanctions, uh, in this interview, which I would urge everyone to watch, I put that critique to her, and she acknowledges it and, and says, you know, she just explains how sanctions have debilitated the economy and how this is the only means of survival of this government that was actually elected to provide to a population that was traditionally completely ignored, marginalized, and living in absolute destitution. So I think you have a perfect example there of the, the failure of those who, pr who push this ultra-left critique of a socialist government struggling against the full force of empire their failure to offer any alternative and their rejection by the working class population. Right. Yeah, and the reality is that we've seen Cuba go through a similar process right now with reforms and it's been st struggling under a suffocating U S blockade now for 60 years. But what, what's often not understood is that Cuba's was able to weather the storm of that blockade when it had the support of the Soviet union and not just the support politically, which people talk about, but understanding it economically. I mean, Cuba is a small island nation that can't produce everything that it needs. So it has to rely to an extent on imports. And because of the U.S. blockade, which, which threatens secondary sanctions on countries that want to do business with China, with Cuba, rather, Cuba is facing an international kind of blockade caused by Washington. So it, it's, being, it's been forced to take a few steps back in order in the f in the future to take steps forward again. I mean, but no one would say, no one's going to say that Cuba is now suddenly capitalist. I mean, no, the reality is that when these countries are suffocating in what is essentially a wartime scenario, I mean, Nicolas Maduro is a wartime president. He has Definitely. never been a, given an, an inch of breathing room. He's been under war since immediately coming into power in 2013. So the reality is that in these I mean, just as in the Soviet Union, they had this policy of war communism. You know, you have to take a few steps back in order just to survive. Because the reality is if you don't survive, I mean, look what happened in the Soviet Union. I mean, a lot never of people never back. thought that, it, yeah, it was just overthrown. And, and, and I was going to make this that, point, sorry to jump in, uh, but I was going to make this point earlier that one of the few times that a leader who was toppled in a coup came back was in Haiti where Bill Clinton restored Jean Bertrand Aristide on the condition that he enact neoliberal reforms, like uh, allowing the uh, basically liquidation of the rice, the local rice economy, and importing rice from Arkansas. So, I mean, that's one of the few cases I can think of, and it wound up having almost the same effect, and it led to a second coup in 2004, where Aristide was ousted and exiled for years. Yeah, well, I, I told people that. We want to bring back Michael Hudson, and you know who's an economic genius, and he can, we can talk more specifically. I mean, 
neither of us is is an economic expert, but <laughs> but Michael yeah. Hudson definitely could provide really good insight into the Chinese economy. And I would invite people to also check out an episode we did with Michael Hudson. We talked partially about China, but it would be good to go into detail. But while we still have you, Daniel, and we're, we're getting around two hours now, so I want to uh, end with a few questions from our Patreon and we can start wrapping up. But there's a few interesting questions here. One of them we kind of addressed from Meeling. We asked if Turkey is training radicalized Uyghurs from China and what China is doing about it. I'll, I'll briefly just answer that because we already talked about it earlier and then I'll get to another question. I'll say that, you know, as Max mentioned, that Erdogan had given speeches praising some of these Uyghur separatist groups. Many of them are based in Turkey, so they have at least indirect political support. But the reality at the same time, recognizing Turkey, it plays an, an interesting kind of complex geopolitical role because Turkey is a member of NATO. Turkey has played a key role in the dirty war in Syria, allied with the US and Saudi Arabia and Qatar and Israel. But also Turkey has its own geopolitical interests. It's been very assertive in the Mediterranean with Greece. And, you know, it, it, it's not totally a, a U.S. puppet. It has its own geopolitical interest. And also China is the second largest economy in the world. Oh. Did we lose Ben? Well, Ben was, you know, Ben was talking about Turkey. And I think we're wrapping up here. But, uh, you know, Turkey definitely has its own geopolitical interest and has played a role in it's a, as actually its goal in northern Syria is to sort of colonize parts of the country and create what it calls a buffer zone, but to move large parts of its population or a refugee population that's sympathetic to Erdogan into Syria. Now, the West has basically supported that, NATO has supported that, but Turkey is also playing a role in fostering a multipolar world and it's using. Uh, it's advantage the advantage of its membership in NATO as a buffer against the kind of pressure that it would get, and it sits at a crossroads with Europe and Iran, for example. But it has established strong relations with Venezuela, so it's it's a much more complicated picture. I mean, it's it's we, we went the first time I went to Caracas, there were pictures of Erdogan up and down the streets in the center of the city because he had just made a trip to the country. They're fostering economic ties. Turkey's basically in its own way, helping to break the blockade, certainly politically. And that's something that NATO countries are upset about. Um, but Turkey has definitely played a role in supporting the uh, Uyghur separatist movement. I mean, we talked about that before. I don't know if we're going to get any more questions. I'm unable to actually read them from the patrons, but uh, Daniel, I don't know if there's any final thoughts you want to leave us with. Yeah, uh, hopefully, hopefully he does get back in time because he said there were a few interesting questions there. But yeah, I'd say the final um, thoughts are, um, you know, I know probably a lot of people um, on the live stream and who'll be watching this are people who already are already open-minded enough to think about the Xinjiang situation um, in uh, outside of the what the mainstream media is talking about. But I will say that... Um, if there are some people who um, aren't really on board with questioning it, try questioning. Try questioning some of the narrative uh, that's going around and see what happens to you. There's no room for nuance. Um, and that's a scary place to be when we're back to that. You're either with us or you're against us. Um, that you, you, you can't have a logical discussion on the fact that, you know, for example, Tursine, the, 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 uh, the concentration camp, supposed concentration camp survivor, whose story has been propped up by CNN and BBC, where BBC uh, you know, retweeted her story seven times within 24 hours. Um, and she's somebody who's on the uh, third or fourth version of her story. And when CNN uh, broadcasted a picture of her passport, they blurred out only the uh, passport renewal date for some odd reason. All the other sensitive information was available. And when you realize why, because the passport renewal date aligns with when she said she was in detention, it starts to, you start to ask some questions. Well, why would they instead of asking questions about this big hole, why would they just want to cover it up and not talk about it? Uh, we're right. getting to a really you know, scary place where- uh, Or the BuzzFeed comments. Yeah, yeah, I just completely, where she experienced no abuse. I mean, that by itself, okay, you know, uh, survivors of abuse, maybe they're more confident to speak about it later. That by itself maybe is not enough, but when you combine all of the other red flags, it starts to get really concerning. And, and you've got, you got to ask yourself, what what is the goal here? What's going on? Um, 
you know, I, I don't think it's been like previous campaigns where the explicit goal is to soften people up for the idea of war. I think it's more to uh, uh, discredit China in the eyes of a lot of the partnerships that they're forging with resource rich countries, which, um, you know, the West previously had a monopoly over. But the problem is, is that it, it, it's excusing more and more aggression. You know, it, it's, it's excusing the idea of sailing American warships closer and closer to the shores of China, or to even talk about a, a network of missiles or just outside of the nine dash line. Um, and so even if softening the public up for a war isn't the explicit goal, you're certainly getting the public on board for more uh, aggression towards China, which is showing in the polls already. And all it takes from there is a small spark um, or a, a small wrong move to potentially snowball into a conflict unlike anything we've ever seen before. I think this is something we should start thinking about. Most people are thinking about what are the consequences of not, sta not standing up if a genocide really is going on, because we always said never again. This is something we've always said never again. So no, we have to speak up, even if we don't have the complete picture. But we have even more of a precedent of what happens when you accept a mainstream media narrative without any ability to, to, to ask critical questions. We should be equally worried about that because that's the even more likely uh, uh, risk at this point in time. Um, so again, I think I might be kind of preaching to the choir here, but if there are a few people who are listening in, um, just just consider that. Stop trying to silence people who are just asking critical questions. You know, there's a guy, uh, Bay Area 415, uh, 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 an attorney from the US. He covers his face to make videos because he's afraid of the backlash that he'll get. Um, he made an amazing video on uh, debunking pretty much every single Xinjiang claim there is. Um, and uh, the, the, the groups came out to basically try to get his video removed. They didn't yeah. come out to say, we need to mobilize and come up with a counter argument or address his concerns. No, it was, we need to get his video removed. So far, yeah. they successfully got it removed from the indexing uh, feature on YouTube. And they're trying to push it further to get it removed completely. I mean, that in itself. The fact that nobody wants to have a discussion about this as soon as you step out of line from the mainstream uh, mainstream media narrative, that's a scary place to be. So I just want anybody who's um, on the other side of this to, to just think about that as well. Yeah, no, that's those comments are so important. I mean, people need to understand we're in an information war. The, the, this is not journalism. The media right. is not acting as objective journalists, reporters, they're not news agencies. They are essentially providing public relations services for the military intelligence apparatus of the US and its allies. <clears throat> and I showed that in my piece on the BBC and Reuters, working through their charity arms with the British Foreign Office to actively infiltrate Russia's media space and sphere of influence in a bid to literally weaken Russia. That was what was stated in the UK Foreign Office documents soliciting programs that the BBC and Reuters bid on. And they proceeded to do just that. These aren't media organizations that as we normally understand them. And so what are they doing to us? They're waging a war on our minds, on our psyche, on our conscience, and they are attempting to ply us into sympathizing with a campaign or taking a political stance that that's not natural. The target here, it's easy to move the, the, the right wingers. It's easy for, for Ben Shapiro to say, oh, there's a Holocaust in China in this socialist country and for him to win his fans. It was much harder for Jacobin to do that, for democracy now to do that. And so there's just this sheer volume of stories to convince progressive minded people that China is a country that we should be not just in a great power competition with, but we should stand up to. We should fight. Yeah, they're 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 yeah they're weaponizing compassion um, and uh, villainizing anybody who steps out of line. I mean, you know, I I speak to there's a guy trying to do um, some stuff similar stuff to what you're doing uh, to expose what the Canadian government does overseas uh, from a, a group called the Canada Files, and even as yeah, as, as yeah, Aiden, yeah, and even though he's re yeah yeah really yeah, everyone should follow Canada Files, and also I meant to mention before uh, watch our. Friend Dan Cohen's video is China committing genocide at behind Oops. the headlines at Mint Press. Great one. I mean, he breaks it all down, and it's, it's yeah. much easier to absorb than our articles at the Gray Zone, which I think are kind of um, much you know secondary, deeper reference. Deeper, yeah, watching it, yeah, but yeah, but what I was going to say with Canada Files, I mean, he lost two of his journalists because he was refusing to follow the Xinjiang genocide narrative, even 
people who presumably would be fairly open-minded to join an organization like that. Um, and I'm sure even you guys, the gray zone, I'm sure even guys who are usually on board for your other stuff might say, oh, now you guys are turning into genocide deniers. It's, well, you know, it, you know, <laughs> I'm sure we, we already went you. through that process on Syria and right. I went through that process and, you know, there was a letter to denounce me because of these piece exposés I wrote about the Syrian white helmets, which have been completely vindicated. They were absolutely factual. No one challenged a single point in them. But, you know, I was known as one of the more prominent voices of the BDS movement. The Palestine Solidarity Movement was sending me around from campus to campus to, you know, speak in support of the boycott, to present my work, my journalism on Israel-Palestine. I'm an advocacy journalist. And, you know, a who's who of that movement or many people basically signed a letter denouncing me and pledging to never work with me again without naming me. Ben was essentially referred to as well, and we could go on and on about it, but it was sort of a painful process. And I'm sure many of those people would be ashamed now that they know that hundreds of members of the so-called members of the White Helmets were evacuated through occupied Golan, the occupied Golan Heights by Israeli intelligence. Um, right. But, you know, whatever, we proved our point. We feel yeah. very confident about where we are, but we went through that process on Syria and this new narrative is so similar to the Syrian narrative. And so many of the same actors are involved, the New Lines Institute. It's basically the same people who tried to discredit us, not just discredit us, but literally dehumanize us for our right. reporting on Syria. Because but, but, yeah, yeah. But so I feel like- what Aiden's going sorry. through at Canada Files, it's the same thing we went through a few years ago. And in a few years, you're going to feel much more confident about it. it. The only thing that matters is being right and having a, a, a having principles and actually sticking to them because we're not trying to get elected to Canadian Parliament or U.S. Congress here. And yeah, then, you know, the, 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 yeah, the interesting thing, too, is, though, that um, you obviously went deep enough uh, before you made uh, your content to know that I, I really believe this is what hap is what's happening. Somebody a little bit less confident, you know, would ask the question, if you were wrong, had you been wrong, that would have never, ever left you. However, the people who were pushing this idea and it turns out they were wrong. There's very little consequences for them. They can move on to the next propaganda campaign, which is the Xinjiang right. campaign. Um, so the, the easiest things to do at this point is for, for people in the West is if they, they can either shout and regurgitate the propaganda that's uh, being spread about Xinjiang, or they can keep quiet if they're unsure. But to actually ask critical questions or speak out, that's the most risky thing you can do. You're going to be called a genocide denier. Um, and it's just not worth the risk for people. And then for the people who are convinced you know, at least stop trying to silence people who just want to ask, you know, some simple questions. I mean, if you're that confident about your narrative, why do you got to be so scared about people just asking a few critical questions? Um, you know, because a lot of those critical questions get to the heart of uh, the fact that a lot of this doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, when we get to this, when we get to this point, and you're seeing a lot of the same red flags about what happens to you when you speak out, even a little bit uh, in deviation from the from the mainstream media. Um, knowing what happens now, it's again, like I said, it's something we should all be worried about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ben, are you there? Yeah. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. I have, to, I, I got to jump off here, but if you, uh, I, I know there are two, I think two more patron questions, uh, for Daniel, if, if you want to continue with yeah, yeah. Well, we can we conclude with these questions here. All right, I, One I'm is gonna, from I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off, Daniel. Thanks a lot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good seeing you again. Yeah. Look forward to joining you on your podcast in the future. And I know you'll tell everyone again where to find your work when uh, this whole sure. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. All right. All right. Take care. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. You had a couple questions, Ben. Yeah. And then there were two. So I, I you probably can't see me. These internet issues I'm going to resolve, but really quickly, Daniel, here's an interesting question from a friend of the show, Kiran Fatima, who said, are Chinese people in the mainland more optimistic than Westerners? I think uh, here they're definitely, this is actually something I was talking about with some friends not too long ago. I think there is a um, an overwhelming sense by the kind of the, my generation um, level kind of people in their thirties and forties that the lives of their children will be better than theirs. Um, there still is optimism about that. 
Whereas in the West, I think uh, they've done polls on this as well. People aren't convinced that the lives of their children will be better than theirs. And I mean, it's been a continual downhill slope, right? I mean, you know, you look at whatever it was 60 years ago, a carpenter with a, a wife who doesn't work can stay at home and they can earn enough to raise a family of five or six kids. Now both parents need to go to work and they can barely, you know, struggle to get by. Um, of course, there are many different segments of society, um, but overall, if you were to average it out, I think people are uh, pretty optimistic about the fact that um, uh, their children will lead, leave, live better lives than them. That's most certainly true for the inner areas. Uh, the risks that I think exist for people in the cities is that um, it's incredibly expensive uh, to live in the major cities. Um, so the prospects of owning apartment at, at, at the current prices, that's probably the only um the only uh, questionable item uh, that uh, I think the government has also said that they're going to start to try to fix um, to, because of the uh, the incredible speculation on the property market. It's just pushed prices up uh, quite high into the cities in the cities. It looks like we lost Ben and I've just turned moderate rebels into my own show now. <laughs> you know, while, while I'm waiting, I'll just kind of reemphasize that point that I was saying, because uh, I think if they were going to ask me. Uh, what I would finish with, it was just what I said about being really worried about uh, the narrative um, and how we're in a situation where it really embodies uh, exactly what Bush said uh, while they were going into Iraq is that you're either with us or you're against us and there's no room to stand in the middle and ask critical questions. Um, if I was in the West and I was working an ordinary job or if I was a government official, I wouldn't be saying what I'm saying. It would just, there'd be too much risk um, so that's why I empathize with a lot of the MPs who voted in favor of it. Actually, the Canadian motion uh, for um, I hope I hope Ben's going to be okay with me taking over the show here. <laughs> but the Canadian motion for to call what's going on in Xinjiang a um, a genocide. I actually reached out to eighty MPs, and uh, almost all of them either completely refused or um, or just ignored me. Uh, there was. One MP who agreed, uh, Scott Atchison from uh, Perry Sound, and um, as we got to the to the agreed upon date, a few hours before they started asking questions about what my show was about, and they probably looked me up and they canceled. They said, "No, sorry, we don't want to talk to you," um, and they weren't interested in rescheduling either. So uh, these MPs are, uh, even though I think it's quite shameful that they are um, confident enough to call what's going on in Xinjiang such a strong name and to promote the idea of boycotting the Beijing Olympics. Um, yet they're not confident enough to speak to somebody who potentially will ask them some difficult questions. I think that's uh, very telling, but at the end of the day, if they're not equipped with enough information and they know that their constituents have been propagandized into one direction in an extreme way, you imagine what the consequences are for them for voting no. Um, you know, that, that obviously it will uh, probably lose them their seat, lose them their votes. And um, again, from the perspective of if you were in their position to vote yes to it and later find out it was just a giant propaganda campaign comes with far less consequences than voting no. And then later finding out you were wrong, that a genocide really was going on. So when you're not equipped with enough information, it's almost obvious that that's the way they would go. I think uh, I gave it more than two minutes. So I, this is the first time uh, that a guest is closing the show for Moderate Rebels. <laughs> uh, thanks everyone for joining. And uh, if you wanna follow me, you can follow me over on my channel. It's uh, just uh, with my name, Daniel Dumbrell. Um, you'll find it under YouTube if you search my name. So thanks to everybody and I'm logging off from here. Peace. And this is Ben Norton. We're just gonna conclude this episode here as you could see. I was having bad internet issues. I'm working on getting that solved in the future. But we were speaking with Daniel Dumbrell. Definitely check out his channel over at YouTube. He has a lot of really interesting content. And please, if you want to support this show, and if you want to ask one of the questions that we responded to in this episode, you can become a, Patria a patron over at Patreon, and you can go to patreon.com slash moderate rebels. Definitely check us out in the future. If you're watching, thanks for watching on YouTube or if you're listening to the podcast version. We have a lot of new content coming soon. So thank you for the support. It really means a lot. And we'll see you next time.